Hello there, Eddie Mercado here with BloodyElbow.com, and I'm about to speak with MMA pioneer Marlis Coonan as she is set to take on Julia Budd for the inaugural Bellator Women's Featherweight Championship on March 3rd. So let's touch base with Marlis Coonan and find out what she's been up to since her last fight. Talk about her fight that was canceled at Bellator 163. And her thoughts on competing for another world title. Ah, Mrs. Marlis Coonan, how are you? Hi, Andy. How are you how doing? doing? I'm well, I'm well. Thank you for taking out the time. I know you're super busy. Huge fight on your hands. You're about to compete yep. for Bellator's first ever women's featherweight championship. How are things? Really good, actually. Yeah, I've never been better, and uh, training camp is uh, is going great. Uh, I didn't have to diet; I was losing weight uh, all of a sudden. So, you know, I'm, if I don't have to diet, I'm happy. <laughs> so, uh, all, things are really going good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, you are a pioneer of the sport. I mean, you were doing this before it was cool, right? Like before anybody <laughs> heard of it, before anyone was doing it. I mean, you were really in the trenches, kind of paving the way uh, for future, I mean, not just female athletes, but, but the men as well. Um, what does it feel like? I mean, you kind of, you've, you've been a world champion, and, and here you are, you have an opportunity to get another belt in another division. Yeah, it, it feels like, even in, in my home country, in the Netherlands, um, when I had interviews with national media and stuff like that, they always called me a kickboxer. Because they had no idea what MMA meant. And now we had Jermaine who won the, uh, the title in the UFC. And all of a sudden, uh, she's in the, on the national news, in late night shows. And I could never dream that MMA would become this big in the Netherlands. I mean, when I started, and, and it's still little here, they think it's for criminals, for low lives, for scumbags. You know, it's not for normal people, and especially not for women. To, to enjoy the sport, so and when I see what's happening in, 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 in the States, of course, but all around the world, it's like, it's, it's finally becoming mainstream, and yeah, it really makes me happy, and not just for myself, because I'm, you know, I'm in the, in the winter of my career, but it's, I think it's uh, great that so many women get the opportunity to find their inner strength, and that's, that's beautiful. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Now, you made your Bellator debut pretty in impressive fashion, Annalisa Bucci. You took her down, pretty much dominant all over, and then you caught like this funky, like one-armed rear naked choke kind of move from like, you were like in, in half guard, but in like a twister position almost. What, was that your first time ever catching that submission, or is that something you've practiced in the gym before? No, it, I think you know that fight was awful because I wanted to finish it in the first round, but I had been puking in the locker room, so I was really afraid that I would puke in the in the cage. So I had to take my pace down. Wow! Uh, but that 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 joke, I know it just happens, but I, I I tend to then I later I realize I I do tap out people more on it, but it, it's just like. I think you have two type of fighters. You have the very analytical fighters, and you have the intuitive fighters. And I'm the second, second. You know, I'm the, the intuitive fighter. And then things just happen in the moment. And I, I've often had stuff like that. When I'm in the moment, I think I'm on my dangerous. So then that's when the choke happened. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it was definitely unique. I'm not sure if I've ever seen that <laughs> specific. Uh, does it? Do you have a name for it or? No, no, <laughs> you make up one. <laughs> <laughs> we can call it the, the Mar joke. <laughs> How about the Marlis Coonan? I, I think that's a that's an excellent suggestion. Now, Thank you, you. your your second performance, um, also uh, pretty dominant on the ground. I mean, Arlene Blanco, uh, she's pretty tough in her own right. What What'd you think of your sophomore performance in Bellator? What is a sophomore? Sophomore is um, like your second time. Like. Oh, okay, okay. Well, that felt better. Um, uh, I mean, Prof. Serene, I think, okay, she doesn't hit as hard as Cyborg. When the first time I fought Cyborg, I was like, someone threw bricks at me. Second time, it wasn't that bad, but 
Eileen really hits hard, really. She has some power punches, and now she's also training on the ground. I'm really looking forward to see her progress and uh, what she's doing in the future. Uh, but that, that felt better. Um, and it's funny you mentioned the fight because I just analyzed it this morning after training. But the, the case was very slippery. And if you watch that fight, you see me like I slip like five, six times uh, during that fight. I'm out of balance because of it. And, um, and I remember she pulled my top down. And then I was busy pulling up my top. You know, you're a girl, you wanted to have it up. And then she attacked me. And again, I was in the moment. And that was like the tipping point of the fight because I took her down. And from there on, I took on the armbar. And that felt good. It felt a little bit of the old Marlou's back again. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely looked like you were trying to readjust and she kind of stormed you. And you're just like, whoa, wait a minute. And then you, you hit a reactive <laughs> double leg, went yeah. right to side control. And that's where you set up the arm bar, transitioned the belly down, and it was a wrap. I like to see uh, grapplers who are confident to lock up a submission from top control and then willing to give up the dominant position if the submission doesn't, doesn't pan out. Um, what kind of gives you the confidence? Is it all the experience? Is it all the finishes on your record? Does that give you the confidence that, hey, I can give up the top position in, in lieu of a submission? Uh, no, I think it's the way I'm trained because I think if you submit to a cage and you're willing to win on points, you don't have the right mindset. It's KO or submission, nothing else. So when I'm fighting, I always go for the okay. I always go for the KO, but I never do that <laughs> somehow. And so then the second best is the submission. So uh, when I have to win on points, it to me it feels like losing. So you know the Romina Sato, of course, and I'm very much inspired by him and by his shooter style. I can remember when I was a young girl and I was with video tapes, you know, there was no internet. <laughs> And I was so, so impressed by him and very inspired. And I love the Japanese way of fighting because they always go for the kill. And that's what I love. Okay. Now, at Bellator 155, you were supposed to fight Julia Budd. She got injured, had to pull out. You fought Alexis Dufresne instead. Dufresne shows up and misses weight. You have to agree on a catchweight fight. And you seem like that it really bothered you. Uh, what was it about her missing weight that really kind of set you off? Well, the training camp was already a heavy one because I had a light concussion during training camp. But because it was for a title fight, I didn't want to pull out. And in two weeks, uh, and it happened in the beginning of the training uh, camp already. So, and then I had done all this sacrifice, right, in my opinion. And then two weeks prior, Julia pulls out. So I was like, hey, fuck it. I already done everything. I'm going and I'm going to fight. So then we arrived and then um, I made the way that did the whole cutting process and everything. And then she comes to me very sheepish and she said, yeah, I had a child and I didn't make weight. But it was the third time in a row. And... Um, you know, I'm very happy for her. She became a mother, but if you, that also tells me she knew up front she would make the weight, and she did make me go through the process of making weight. And then, uh, if she had said it uh, before, like, okay, I just had a baby, I cannot make the 145, just and let's do 150, fine, no problem, let's do that. But don't come to me sheepish like that. And it's not the first time it happened. It's the third time in a row that it happened. So I think it's very disrespectful to, to not only to me, but to the to Bellator. I mean, they put a lot of money in, in bringing in fighters, buying tickets, hotels and everything. And then you, you only have one job you signed for. You have to sign an agreement that you will have that weight on that day. That's your job. So, you know, and then I also spoke to a guy who had been with her in the uh, sauna and then her trainer wanted to do her a few rounds and then she just gave a big mouth to her trainer and she stormed off. And he told me that after that. And then oh, after wow. the weigh-in, we were backstage and she had a big mouth to my trainer. And at that point, I always, I'm, I almost attacked her. I, I just took some <laughs> coconut water and I relaxed. And then people came in the team, but at that, at that moment, I was ready to take her on. So I was so mad at her. And also what happened with myself, you know, the disappointment with not fighting for the title and, and yeah, everything. 
So I have never had it before, but when I normally when I'm in the cage, it's a mixture of feelings. Like I'm really aggressive, but I'm also like very like okay, you have to be on your TV because you want to win. But this time I only felt hate. I was so mad, and of course I had analyzed her, and <laughs> and I saw her fighting from her back, and I wasn't too impressed by that. So it it was my own mistake. I fought on emotion. And I underestimated her, and, and, and that's also an arrogant thing of myself, and I had to pay for that. And actually, it was the first time, and I've lost before, but I know what happened when I lost, and I know the circumstances, and that's another story. But this time, it felt for me for the first time in my life that I had truly lost, and I just couldn't comprehend, and I, I remember I was there on, on the cage, and... 95% of me was busy with processing the loss and then she was wanted to shake my hands, but somehow it just didn't connect in my mind. And then um, after we were still in the cage, I went to her and I went to her train and I shook hands. And if you lose, you have to show respect. And after that, I saw her also in the locker rooms and I said it again, I said, good job. But then a few days later, I heard the big mouth that she gave in the cage. And then I was pissed off again. So there's a bit of still bad blood between her and me. Okay. What would you say was the biggest takeaway from uh, suffering the loss? Well, you know, when Ronda now um, lost for the second time, the first time when Ronda lost, I was like, well, yeah, she had it coming. And then the second time, I could feel her pain. And uh, I think I grew as a person from it. You know, you feel if you truly lose uh, on a stage, it, it, I mean, it's a vulnerable thing. Eh? You, everybody's love fights this, fights so tough. But it's a very vulnerable thing if you lose in front of all those people and then they can replay it and replay it and comment on it and everything. So, um, yeah, I hated it. I lost. I know I'm a better fighter than do freshly. It was my own fault because I, I remember that I was in the cage. And I heard my corner saying, and I heard, I thought they said 10 seconds. And I was so mad at myself. And I said to myself, Marlushi, let it go out of the first round. But they said, actually, 30 seconds. And I was busy, so busy with myself that I didn't see the armor coming. So, I mean, good for her. She did a good job. But I, I know why I lost. And, but I truly lost. And I learned a lot from it. And I think as a human, I grew from it. Is that a fight you want back? Is there a rematch maybe in the future for you two? Yeah, but, you know, I wanted to fight it straight away. And I told Bellator that as well. And then she refused to fight me because she only wanted to fight me for the title. And I'm like, what kind of wanker are you? If you want to fight, you want to fight. You know, you fight a person until they don't want to fight you anymore. And she thinks she, she has this lousy record and she doesn't make way three times in a row. And then she can think she can command people, organizations. It's just not respectful. So, no, I have no respect for her at all. And uh, But, you know, um, I have only one job to do, and that's on March 3rd. And so my focus is there. And it's Julia. Julia is a very dangerous fighter. So I'm not thinking about anyone else but Julia. Okay. Uh you were scheduled to fight Talita Noguera at Bellator 163 last November. She didn't make weight. <laughs> the fight was canceled. Um, was Did the Alexis Dufresne fight have something to do with you not wanting to do a catch weight with Noguera? Yeah, because, you know, I have the feeling that a lot of girls are afraid for me in the cage. And so they want to bring in a lot of uh, weight. And then uh, they maybe have trainers that don't realize that women don't cut that much weight easy as, as men do. And I think that's happened with Dufresne and I think that's happened with Talita. Yeah, well, I know Julia will make weight. She's a professional. Yeah, so I was like, um, I blew a title shot because I was so nice to fight, you know. Because I was in America and I was like, okay, I flew all the way out here. I had the concussion. I had to work the whole training camp. Let's fight. But then on fight day, people don't realize, but the difference can be like 15 pounds. And I did felt the weight difference when I was fighting the fresh knee. So uh, I, I took another look at uh, Talita, and the doctor told her she couldn't make weight anymore. And then the decision was mine. And the first thing that uh, went through my mind, like instantly, was like, fuck it, I'm not going to do it again. 
You know, I think you have to send out a message because what if I would have taken the fight? I would have fought her. She would have been 15 pounds heavy. It's the same thing what Alexis does. Everybody, she's not like, yeah, I won, I won. No, you uh, were too fat. You didn't make weight, and then you won. You know, to me, she didn't really won. And uh, but nobody sees that because in my record, it's noted as as a as a loss. So I didn't want to risk it again. I think people, if you sign a contract two months in advance, you know, you have to make weight, you have to be in weight. And it's not my fault if you don't make weight. So I really wanted to send out a message. Okay. Now, on your plate right now, Julia Budd for the very first ever Bellator Featherweight Championship. What do you think of this stylistic matchup between the two of you? She's kind of a grinder, really likes to close the distance, work for the takedown. Yeah, I, well, I, I, I saw a fight with um, uh, Arlene Blanco, and that was a completely different fight than my fight with Arlene Blanco. And I think Arlene also had a lot of injuries, and she didn't have a, too good of a training camp. So that tells me enough about Julia. Um, I think she's very strong. She has a good cardio. Uh, I don't know if her mental game is that strong because she refused to fight Cyborg. I believe it was in Strike Force or in Invicta. That tells me something. Uh, she pulled out twice for her fights because I wanted to fight her in January. She said, no, no, I cannot make it till March. I don't know why because she said, I kick on a foot in our fight with Arlene. I was, I believe, in October. Well, if you kick on a foot, you'll be able to fight in January again, no problem. So that tells me a little bit about her mental game, but she's tough. I know I'm in for a, for a very tough fight and um, I'm prepared. I don't think her stand up is, a, is as good as mine, I don't think her ground is as good as mine. And in the wrestling, is, uh, it will be very interesting. She has a really good wrestling game, especially against the cage. I mean, you have fought pretty much everybody there is. I mean, all the big names. Misha Tate, Sarah Kaufman, Liz Carmouche, Cyborg twice. I mean, is there anything that Bud is going to bring to the table that you haven't seen already? A good question. No, actually, no. Do you think she's ready for a Marlis Kunin? Like, she's fought Ronda Rousey, Amanda Nunes, Jermaine Durandamy, but those were really early on in her career. Do you think it's it's the right time for her to be fighting a Marlis Kunin? It's never the right time for her. <laughs> <laughs> I really want the belt, believe me. You have no idea. Yeah, she's kind of shown... Uh, she loves to grapple. She loves to clinch. She also shows kind of a... Uh, a lack of a desire to stand and trade. I mean, you stood in the pocket with Cyborg and let him fly. Um, what do you think it is about her that kind of shies away from the stand-up? Well, she's a Thai boxer from origin, so she, you would expect her to, to stand and trade. I have no idea. Maybe it's a lack of confidence. I, I really have no idea. I saw her fighting against another girl in... Uh, uh, in Bellator and then in between rounds a coach told her keep it standing keep it on the foot and she didn't do it so yeah you should ask her that question <laughs> I don't care if it's stand up if it's wrestling if it's ground I'm the better fighter I know that so how's your training camp going for this are you training at Golden Glory for this as well no no actually this training camp and a previous training camp I've been training with Rumor at my own gym our group in Amsterdam and it's going fantastic. I was like um, a few weeks uh, ago already ahead of the schedule, and I've actually I've never felt better. It, it, it sounds yeah, everybody says this maybe every time, but the way we're training me, it's awesome, and uh, I have so much energy, and I'm feeling really confident. So yeah, but I won't be too cocky. <laughs> I will not make the mistake again. You will see a Marlon who's very very focused and. Uh, I will not underestimate Julia. She's a really dangerous fighter. It will be a tough fight, but I also know that I will win. How do you see it playing out? You think you're going to get the finish? I mean, you finished 20 out of 23 of your opponent or out of your wins. So, I mean, is, is another yeah, finish? If it's up to me, no, yeah. If it's, I want to go for a knockout, but I always say that in a win and I'm submission. But the knockout is, in my eyes, the most beautiful thing there is. 
Okay. And what would be next for Marlis Kunin? Oh, no, I'm not thinking about that at all. There I'm is not, no next the, um, It's only the belt that I'm focusing on. And after that, I will see what happens. But I need that belt. I want that belt. And I will get that belt. Awesome. Well, did you happen to catch uh, Jermaine Durandamy's performance and her winning uh, the UFC 145 title against Holly Holm? Uh, I saw a few clips uh, of it on Instagram because now I'm so in my own zone. I don't want to see other stuff. But Umar, uh, my trainer, is also a commentator for Fox in the Netherlands. He has seen the fight, and he so he told me how it was. But it was basically uh, five rounds uh, stand up, and um, yeah, that that was it. And she won on points. Do you have any relationship with her? Have you guys ever trained together or anything like no. that? No, because she was always a Thai boxer in the Netherlands, and I was always the MMA fighter. And then she, uh, uh, I don't know how long ago, a few years ago, she uh, um, transferred to MMA. There was I wanted to, we wanted to train together, but then my my then coach didn't want me to do it because he wanted me to fight her first, and then uh, he told me that her trainer said that she didn't want to fight me or something like it, and then it never happened anymore. But. And there was a point, I think, around two, 2009 that I really wanted to train with her because she's such an amazing stand-up fighter. So I'm really happy for her. She made, uh, she won that belt. Okay, now, Durand me, if she faces Marlis Kunin, who takes it? Yeah, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it is, to me, that's a no-brainer because I'm, she's not well-rounded like I am. And I've seen her other fights in, uh, in the UFC. She, she cannot grapple like I can. And um, she's a more experienced Thai boxer, but there's a difference in MMA stand-up fighting and uh, Thai boxing fighting. So no, to me, it's a no-brainer. But still, I'm happy for her because she's doing an, a really good ambassador uh, role here in the Netherlands for MMA. So that's fantastic. Okay, now, immediately after her fight in the ring or in the cage, she... Uh they were asking her about fighting Cyborg, and she says she has a hand injury she has to get surgery on. So a lot, I'm not saying she's ducking Cyborg, but a lot of people are known for not wanting to fight Cyborg, ducking Cyborg. Why is that? Why is everyone so afraid of, of Cyborg? You fought her twice. I mean, what's the, what's the deal? Uh, I don't think Jermaine is afraid of Cyborg at all. I don't think that. I think she's the better stand-up fighter too. I mean, uh, Cyborg for the Thai boxing fight against Yurina, for, uh, Yurina Bars, the Dutch Thai boxing champion, and she lost. Um, the first time I fought Cyborg, I think she was on her inner prime. And uh, I like Cyborg a lot, by the way. I think she's a nice girl, a woman. Uh, but then I, it really felt like somebody was throwing bricks at me. And then the second time, I, I had a, there was a lot going on. I had I needed surgery in my neck. I needed surgery in my knee. Uh, this, I had cuts above my eyes. It needed longer time to heal than then I had. There was a lot of private stuff that was going on. So and I had to face my face my angst gegner, as they say in German. You know, the person you're afraid to fight. And uh, so that was a very mentally very, very tough fight for me. And I think I've never seen that fight back. I, I know I fought like a whip. No, and, uh, no, 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 no. I, Yeah, I did. No. I, don't know, I don't know much about the fight. I just know I lost and did fight a good fight. But um, what I do remember from that fight is that she didn't hit that hard anymore. The first time I fought her, she hit harder than the second time. And when I look at her fight, she... I don't know, she cannot show how much she has progressed over the years because she always beat the women up within one round. Um, yeah, and she's getting older and she, I think she, she has put her body through a lot of things like with the cutting weight. I think it was a shame of the UFC what they did to her. Um, they should have given her the 145 uh, option way sooner. I think, yeah, it was really bad. Um, but, you know, um, all those women see her uh, beat up other women within one round. And I, I just think they're afraid of, of for the pain. I know there's this uh, featherweight champion of Invicta. I forgot her name. And I want to see her fight a few more fights. And then I want to see her fight Cyborg. She, I think she will be the new champion uh, in like a few years. Okay. So you would pick Cyborg over Jermaine Durandamy? 
Ja, yeah, Jamal is not, um, she's not an MMA fighter like Cyborg is. Cyborg is a ground game and grappling is way better. Uh, but I don't think that Jermaine is afraid of her stand-up at all. I mean, Jermaine is a really, really, really good stand-up fighter, and she reads really, really hard. Don't underestimate her. Yeah, uh, I would love to see it. I hope it happens. Now, yeah, me too. Uh, you've been in the game since 2000, and it really has changed over the years, and it's probably going to continue to sh change. In your opinion... What is the MMA landscape going to look like in five years? Well, what, what happened? Uh, what's happening now? I expected it five years ago already that it would happen, you know, with the women and, and so on. I think it will be way more mainstream. I think the companies will be, um, you know, I see it happening here in the Netherlands. All of a sudden, fighters are interesting. They, they, Come just like that with the stars of Paige Van Zandt, stuff like that is happening in the Netherlands now too. And um, I think the fighters will make more money. I think there will be a fighter union. Um, I think it will be just more professional like the other American sports are. And uh, I see a bright future for MMA because if you if you look at MMA, if you're used to MMA, and all of a sudden you're gonna watch, uh, you know, a kickboxing fight. If I'm watching it all the time, I'm like, oh, hey, they quit already. Oh, hey, why did they quit? You know, it's not as exciting as MMA is. And boxing, for me, is the same thing. And MMA is everything. And uh, if you're more like, you love the stand-up, you will see love stand-up. If you like the grappling, you will see that. So it has something for everyone. So I see a very, very bright future with a lot of stars and uh, also a lot of female stars in the game. And it makes my heart very, uh, very happy. <laughs> I dig it. I dig it. Well, do you have any sponsors or people you want to give a thank you to? I'm so shitty at this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, a rumor. I would like to think a rumor a lot. Yeah. And Scott, of course. Awesome. And how can people follow you on your journey? What are your social media platforms? Uh, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I don't do the Snapchat thing. That's nothing for me, so... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> awesome. Well, Marlis Kunin, thank you so much for taking out the time, and thank you for everything that you've done for the sport of MMA. You have a huge fight in your hands. Julia Budd on March 3rd, Bellator 174 for the inaugural women's featherweight title. Best of luck to you. Thank you for your kind words, Eddie. Bye-bye. So there you have it. MMA pioneer Marlis Kunin set to take on Julia Budd at Bellator 174 on March 3rd. That will be for the inaugural Women's Featherweight Championship. Go check it out. In the meantime, you can read me over at bloodyelbow.com. You can follow me on Twitter at the Eddie Mercado. If you like this interview, subscribe to my channel right here. Go check out Bloody Elbow's YouTube channel right here. couple interviews to check out here. Now go be a good person.